Okay, great. Okay, welcome to the uh, Good Hormone Health webinar, November 7, 2021. I'm very happy to host Dr. Tobias Carlene. Dr. Carlene is the director of the Adrenal Center in Tampa, and I'll show his credentials in the next two slides. Um, he's to talk today is an amazing talk, the 20 minute mini back scope adrenalectomy. And I wanna just go over the reasons for adrenal surgery, the most um, common, at least for our patients here, is bilateral adrenalectomy for pituitary or topic Cushing's. This is ACTH dependent. If you have a low ACTH, you have adrenal Cushing's. If you have medium to, uh, to high-ish ACTH, you have pituitary Cushing's. And if you have quite high ACTH, you have ectopic Cushing's. And we usually treat uh, pituitary Cushing's with pituitary surgery or medications. And people know I use a lot of the medicine ketoconazole. Um, but there are plenty of patients that uh, break through the medicines or they don't work. They are not a candidate for pituitary surgery. So these are the people that would be a candidate for, as we call them in the, in the um, chat, some BLA or bilateral adrenalectomy. The second debt issue I put here, a reason for adrenal surgery is um, unfortunately common. Uh, I shared my article with Dr. Carling. His comment was, you know, unfortunately, you know, some of the adrenal surgeons aren't that good. And they either they leave behind or remnant tissue develops. Um, and we've have, I have a series of about 11 patients with adrenal remnant tissue. These are very difficult to find the adrenal tissue and to remove it. And Dr. Carling is um, an expert at reviewing the CAT scans and looking for this adrenal remnant tissue. So this would be another indication for adrenal surgery. There are pa patients and, um, you know, it's, at least in the literature, it's quite common, although I have a little less of these patients that have adrenal Cushing's. This is ACTH independent. You have a low ACTH. You have one nodule on an adrenal or uh, often or sometimes multiple nodules on one adrenal, um, and you would get a unilateral adrenalectomy. There are patients that have what's called an aldosteronoma. They have high aldosterone levels and low renin levels. Um, biochemical testing confirms that it's an aldosteronoma and not this bilateral aldosterone hyperplasia. These are good candidates for unilateral adrenalectomy. And then um, the patients with pheochromocytoma, which I see very little of, um, they would be a candidate for mostly a unilateral adrenalectomy and occasionally a bilateral adrenalectomy. Okay, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Carlene, but I'll do the slides. Um, Dr. Carlene is surgeon in chief and founder of the Carlene Adrenal Center, the hospital for endocrine surgery in beautiful Tampa, Florida. His website is adrenal.com. Go ahead, Dr. Carlene. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Friedman. It's a, it's a great uh, honor and privilege to be talking to to you all about my favorite topic, which is adrenal surgery and adrenal disease. And as Dr. Freeman uh, told, we have significant experience with adrenal surgery in all, uh, all those uh, settings, as he described, as well as uh, an, an area that's actually increasing for us. And I'm not going to talk to too much, but uh, in adrenal metastasis from other primary malignancies where the patient has an isolated metastasis. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can jump to the next slide. So as uh, Dr. Friedman mentioned, um, I'm in, in Tampa, Florida uh, for just to give you a brief background. And if you're wondering where my accent is from, I'm originally from Sweden. I did my MD PhD at Uppsala University in Sweden. And and uh, long story short, in, 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 uh, um, a story in, involves my now wife. Uh, we've been together almost 21 years, but long story short, I uh, spent some time in San Diego. We met, uh, plans changed because I was gonna join the uh, endocrine surgery team in Uppsala, which is one of the premier endocrine surgery practices in Europe. Uh, I ended up at Yale and was at, at Yale University for almost 20 years and, and was the chief of endocrine surgery. But the opportunity to move to Tampa to create something truly unique with our own hospital. I was, uh, I, I, I was probably the busiest adrenal surgeon in the country at Yale, but there was very, uh, it was still frustrating in the sense that I could only reach a very small percentage of patients. Uh, because as I'm sure you all know, um, adrenal diseases, adrenal tumor diseases are highly underdiagnosed and undertreated, whether it's subclinical 
Cushing syndrome, overt Cushing syndrome, uh, hyperaldosterone isomorphia chromosatoma. So we really set out to revolutionize uh, the knowledge of adrenal tumor disease through adrenal.com. And, and uh, despite COVID, I'm happy to report that we're by far the busiest adrenal surgery practice in the country. We're doing up to six to eight operations in a single day. Wow. Uh, so, so this um, this Christmas and New Year's, we're moving into the brand new hospital. So this is a hospital, ex uh, the first of its kind, exclusively uh, focused on endocrine tumor disease. So it's only adrenal, parathyroid, and thyroid uh, so it's a full-fledged hospital with eight operating rooms, a, a freestanding emergency room, and inpatient beds, and that's that's where all patients with with, with uh, adrenal surgery is going to be be hosted. And, and my practice is such that about seven eight percent of patients come from outside the state of Florida, so uh, it's conveniently located very close to the airport, about ten minutes from Tampa International Airport. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, all four groups, uh, the scarless thyroid surgery practice, the thyroid center practice, and the parathyroid practice, and then the Carling Adrenal Center are all host in this uh, unique hospital. Next slide, please. So, so why focus on adrenal surgery? Well, as I will talk a little bit, I, I had a strong scientific interest in adrenal tumor disease. And I'll present some of our original uh, scientific work on both uh, cortisol producing tumors and aldosterone producing tumors. But adrenal surgery is, an adrenal tumor disease is some of the most underserved area in, in medicine or in surgery. Uh, as an example, the, the median number of adrenal operations being performed by American adrenal surgeons is one per year. So uh, that's a big problem. So a lot of, op uh, and as Dr. Freeman alluded to, the problems with adrenal remnant, as you can imagine, if you do one operation a year of something, it's, it's going to be very difficult to be an expert on that operation. And because very... Uh, the, there's very few experts on this operation and there's many different approaches and there's essentially eight different approaches to do adrenal surgery and I hope I'll convince you at the end of this talk that the mini back scope adrenalectomy is by far the superior uh, way to remove the adrenal gland going through three small incisions at, at the lower back Traditionally, uh, laparoscopic transabdominal adrenalectomy, where you do it laparoscopically through the abdomen, uh, abdomen has been done with or without a hand port, with or without a, a robot. Uh, obviously, various types of open adrenalectomy is used for very large tumors or adrenal, adrenal cortical cancer. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and you can move to the next slide. So as I mentioned, the mini-back scope adrenalectomy is the preferred approach in 96.3% of our cases. And the reasons are pretty simple. It's because it's a better operation. It's a faster operation. I entitled this talk, the 20 minute adrenalectomy. Uh, the fastest we actually done this is about 12 minutes. Again, it doesn't really, it's not important in itself how fast the operation is as long as it's done safely. But the faster operation means less pain, less time under anesthesia, less problems with neurocognitive uh, issues or potential issues with. Uh, uh, yeah, so I got a comment on a patient, can it be done in obese patients? I'll get to that in, in the next slide. So I'll answer your question. Uh, the patient has a lot shorter length of stay, quicker recovery, less pain, and super superior cosmesis. Uh, next slide. Uh, the patient is, uh, is placed in the prone position under general anesthesia. Next slide. Uh, there's three small incisions. So as you can see here, the 
the tip of the 11th and the 12th rib uh, are indicated and there's three small incisions just below, uh, just superiorly to the hip bone. Next slide, please. And this is the view uh, schematically. So the beauty of this operation is instead of going through the abdomen, when you go through the abdomen on the left side, you have to move the kidney, you have to move the tail of the pancreas, you have to move the spleen, you have to move the colon, and on the right side, the liver and the uh, inferior vena cava. The beauty of this operation is that you go th through uh, the back, you get right on top of the kidney and the adrenal sits right there. Uh, so it's, it's, that's why the operation is a lot faster. And I think it's particularly beneficial in patients requiring bilateral adrenalectomy because if you do bilateral adrenalectomy through the abdomen, you have to put the patient on the side, do one side, then flip the patient during the operation and then do the other side. When you do a bilateral ad adrenalectomy through the mini back scope approach, you just do one side and then the surgeon walks around the table and continues on the other side. There's no movement of the patient. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is what the uh, three small stereo strips looks uh, like. And this uh, path uh, gross pathology just depicts a typical 1.5 centimeter aldosterone producing tumor. Next slide. So um, a bilateral adrenalectomy would take twice as long. Yeah, correct. So you do one, one side at, at the time. Uh, technically, you could, if you're two surgeons, you could operate on both sides at the same time. You know, since I do all my operations myself and I prefer to do it that way, I, I would do it sequentially. So it would uh, typically uh, be 20 minutes on, on each side. Uh, so as, as one of the uh, audience members uh, alluded to, you know, can this be performed also in obesity? So this graph shows the duration of surgery for minibax scope adrenalectomy in relationship to the BMI of the patient, meaning the operative uh, time. And, and an easy way to explain to other doctors and to patients is the time of the operation is approximately the same as the BMI of the patient, meaning the body mass index. So for instance, if you're a quite a slender person, person with a BMI of 20 or less, the operation takes about 20 minutes. And if uh, the BMI uh, is 25 or 30, it takes about 25 or 30 minutes. Once and, and so forth up to uh, a BMI of 45. Once you get uh, up to a BMI close to 45, that's uh, when it, it makes things a lot more technically challenging. And this is, uh, it's technically challenging whether you do it through the mini back scope adrenalectomy or through the laparoscopic transabdominal approach. And the reason has to do it, when you do it through the back, if there's too much, um, uh, if, the, if there's too much obesity and the distance between the skin and to where the adrenal is, if it's too long distance, it can create too much torque on the instrument and you can actually uh, potentially break the cameras uh, or break the instruments during the procedure. So sometimes uh, in patients with a BMI or four to five, it can be very difficult. But this is also true whether you go through the through the abdomen. So in these situations, we try to put the patients on a weight loss regimen. Uh, in in some cases, we even have recommended patients to to undergo a, a bariatric procedure prior to uh, a, 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 you know, adrenalectomy. So in, to answer the question of the audience member, in almost all patients, even in obesity, we can do it this way. But if the BMI is, is very high, we may take some alternative approaches, either to do it through the front or uh, uh, try to achieve either medical or surgical weight loss uh, before dealing with the adrenal. Obviously it depends on, on the underlying pathology. If you have an adrenal cortical cancer, of course you're gonna, you're gonna operate as soon as possible on the, on the adrenal. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, operation can be as quick as 12 minutes for non-obese patients. 
And if you compare that to laparoscopic transabdominal adrenalectomy uh, at almost all institutions that takes about uh, two to four hours, uh, even at the most experienced, uh, uh, you know, Ivy League university hospitals type of setting. And then if you add robotic uh, approach, which doesn't add anything except time and cost, uh, that uh, adds another hour. So it's not infrequent that an operation that uh, should really be able to be performed in 12 to 15 minutes is done uh, in four to six uh, hours, even at the most prestigious hospitals around the country. Uh, next slide, please. So we're gonna uh, just give a quick background about, uh, we're gonna talk first about aldosterone producing tumors, then cortisol producing tumors, and then a little bit about pheochromocytoma, and then we tie everything uh, back together. But I just wanted to give a little bit of a history um, and, and uh, scientific history how we really got excited about adrenal tumor disease. So when I started on the faculty at Yale University, uh, not much was known about aldosterone producing tumors. The only thing we really knew was that they were monoclonal tumors, but nobody had any idea uh, what genes were altered or dysfunctional in these tumors or, um, or uh, and, and, and how they developed. So through a collaboration with my previous team back in Sweden, uh, we put together a, a very well characterized uh, cohort of 22 patients with biochemically unequivocal primary hyperaldosteronism. Uh, they all had uh, uh, both biochemical and clinically obvious disease. The tumor diameter uh, ranged from nine millimeters up to uh, four and a half uh, centimeters. They all were, were hypotensive and they all were hypokalemic, uh, some of them requiring uh, potassium supplementation. Next slide, please. And without going into the science too much, uh, you know, the primary hyperaldosteronism is characterized as, as uh, Dr. Friedman by uh, too much aldosterone and then suppressed renin. So what we showed in this initial study published in Science is that the most common genetic cause of uh, primary hyper hyperaldosteronism are somatic mutations in a gene called KCNJ5. Uh, so what does this uh, gene do? Well, in the normal aldosterone producing granulosa cell of the adrenal gland, you have a, a potassium channel that's selective for potassium and that keeps the membrane hyperpolarized and the cells quiet. But then when you have a normal stimulation to produce more aldosterone, such as increased extracellular potassium or binding of angiotensin 2 to its receptor that leads to uh, membrane depolarization that opens the voltage gated calcium channels and leads to cell proliferation and aldosterone production. But when you have a mutation in this gene that we identified, again, these are somatic mutations. This occur within the tumor. Occasionally, they can be uh, inherited and passed on in an in a autosomal dominant fashion, but that's very rare. But in the somatic sporadic fashion, the potassium channels or the mutation in the potassium channel le leads to leakage of sodium into the cell. And this leads to a constitutive activation of the cell and cell proliferation and aldosterone secretion. Next slide, please. Yeah, that, that's okay. You, you can forward. Um, so so why, why is this important? Well, this is not only important that we figured out why aldosterone producing tumors uh, occur in the, in, the, in the first place. You know, the reason you have these mutations are bad luck, if you will, but we now know and understand the molecular pathogenesis. But it turns out that this type of mutations are related to the clinical 
and the radiological and the pathological phenotype. So one of the challenges with aldosterone producing tumors are that it's not infrequent uh, that the patient may have a CT scan that doesn't show an obvious tumor or, they, or it shows uh, tumors on both sides, but you don't know which one is overproducing aldosterone. And about 50% of patients have bilateral disease and surgery is not uh, as effective if the patient has bilateral disease versus unilateral disease. But it turns out that this mutations, uh, uh, the type of uh, the genotype of the mutations is, are related to what the scans look like. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide again. So when you actually, uh, when we studied this, based on an unenhanced CT scan, as well as some of the other patient characteristics, uh, we have a pretty good way of predicting which type of mutation the patient's going to have. So for instance, in panel A, as you see, there's a typical uh, 2.7 centimeter left adrenal tumor. And this one is very lipid. Uh, uh, lipid containing very low Huntsville unit. So in a slightly smaller tumor that is uh, contains a lot of fat, the chances, especially if it's a young woman, that uh, is that this patient's going to have a sporadic mutation in case in MG5. And why is that important? Well, I know that if I operate on this patient and remove the left adrenal, not only am I very confident that we're, re we're removing the left side, so this patient may uh, uh, skip the step of adrenal vein sampling, which is an invasive interventional radiology procedure. But I, I can also counsel the patient that uh, it, she's gonna do phenomenally well with surgery. There's a good chance she's gonna be completely cured of her high blood pressure, cured of her um, hypokalemia, the low potassium. Uh, similarly, the uh, CACNA1D and ATPA1 mutants, I didn't go into those, but those are other less common mutations that occur in these aldosterone producing tumors. Uh, uh, they tend to be more lipid rich tumors and tend to be smaller, whereas wild type tumors tend to be a little bit more heterogeneous. So we, we're starting to scratch the surface, uh, understanding the correlation between the type of genetic changes that occur in adrenal tumors and what the clinical characteristics of those patients are. Uh, next slide, please. So we do know, uh, based on genetic as well as clinical data that there's a very high probability of a unilateral aldosterone producing adenoma if the patient has a very high plasma aldosterone concentration, high 24-hour urine aldosterone levels, very low potassium, uh, if they have very severe hypertension, and if they respond very well to a mineral receptor antagonist. So for instance, the two most commonly used are spironolactone and epiteranone. So if somebody has hyperaldosteronism and they respond very well to those med medications, that's a telltale sign that indeed uh, they may benefit very well uh, with, from, from surgery. Next slide, please. So I have two questions on that. So you recommend yeah. the, the trial of the mineral coronary antagonist before yeah. surgery? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I do because uh, often, uh, often uh, for, for two for two reasons number one is that it's often difficult to get control of the of the hypertension of primary hyperaldosteronism without using uh, spironolactone and aplerinone and b uh, uh, two uh, if they if they do respond very well to spironolactone uh, that's that's usually a telltale sign and, and often that of of course, helps with the hypokalemia that, that often goes with this patient. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I do like to do the trial, but then it comes up the question, if they do so well in small lactone, why do I bother the surgery? Yeah, uh, and that's a good question. And I think I'll, I'll answer those on the next couple of, of okay. questions because you definitely want to send those for surgery. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and it's because of this. Um, so 
it's because of the direct aldosterone effect. So, uh, so the outcomes are about 30 to 60 percent that have hypertension or cured, and almost 100 percent are improved of their hypertension, meaning you are able to reduce the number of medications, and uh, you have a 100 percent cure rate of hyperkalemia. But the important point is hypertension is only part of fixing the problem because you have a direct aldosterone effect. So if you, uh, if you, if you compare patients that have the exact, if the age, gender, and blood pressure matched, uh, two groups. So you have patients with essential hypertension and patients that have hypertension due to primary hyperaldosteronism. They have the exact same uh, blood pressure, patients with hypertension due to primary hyperaldosteronism, hyperaldosteronism have a close to a thousand percent increased risk of stroke, heart attacks, and um, uh, arrhythmias. Uh, and that's due to that direct toxic aldosterone effect. So to your point, uh, Dr. Friedman, um, even if you can control the blood pressure, that's that's just a small piece of the puzzle. You still have those patients are still running around with very high aldosterone levels, and that direct aldosterone effect on myocardial fibrosis and left ventricle ventricular hypertrophy and 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 um, uh, increased risk of congestive heart failure and mortality. So uh, I, I know that that a lot of um, you know, practitioners see that improvement in spironolactone and feel very encouraged, and and they 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 lose a little bit of that enthusiasm of sending the patient for surgery. I would argue the other way around, meaning if they respond very well to spironolactone, then be even more enthusiastic about sending them mm -hmm. for surgery. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. So um, after we operate on this uh, patient, so. What, what I always tell all patients is that when you operate on a patient with pheochromosatoma, I, I, you know, we cure the blood pressure like that in the operating room. In fact, often the blood pressure drops so low uh, that we might have to support your blood pressure during the operation. With hyperaldosteronism, it doesn't work like that, meaning the improvement in, in blood pressure takes several weeks to months. So. Uh, right in the peri and post-operative period, it's very important to very carefully monitor the blood pressure and heart rate. So uh, already in the hospital, what we'll do is uh, we stop uh, all potassium supplementation. And sometimes people take an, an enormous amount of extra potassium, uh, often about uh, up to 100, 120 milli equivalents. Uh, and if that's the case, we might stop it, but then replace it or replace it for about a week at a half dose or so, because the hypokalemia corrects pretty quickly within the next couple of days. Uh, we stop the uh, spironolactone or eplerinone as they're on, uh, but continue uh, most other medications, including beta blockers. Remember, a lot of these patients are on five to six five to six blood pressure medications before the operation. But if they're only on one or two, we can certainly stop uh, both of them in the, in the operating room. But I tell all patients to carefully measure their blood pressure and heart rate at least twice a day. And then we work with the endocrinologist to add uh, back or delete uh, other drugs as indicated. And again, uh, patience is the name of the game uh, when it comes to blood pressure. Usually it takes weeks to months for, for the blood pressure to uh, normalize. And um, in, in terms of, uh, uh, there's been a number of large uh, trials that have uh, uh, compared surgery versus medical therapy. And there's no question that patients that have surgery, uh, that can have surgery, meaning they have unilateral disease based on uh, either a scan or adrenal vein sampling uh, do much better than those that are only on medical therapy. But medical therapy certainly should be used in patients that have bilateral disease or in those that are not candidates for surgery. Uh, next slide, please. So 
So Crohn's syndrome is, is very common uh, and it's not harmless. A number of large epidemiological study, most of them are, this particular study is from, from Italy, most of them are from Europe, but uh, they, it shows very consistently that it's the cause of hypertension in 10% of all patients uh, uh, with, that has been deemed to have essential hypertension. Next slide. And as, as I indicated, uh, this is the study I referred to that compared patients with essential hypertension head-to-head -head comparison with those that had hypertension due to primary hyperaldosteronism. And as you can see, the odds ratio of stroke, MI, and atrial fibrillation is, is vastly, vastly higher. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and, and the big, big problems with Con syndrome before we move on to Cushing syndrome is that greater than 95% of all patients with the disease are, are not diagnosed and, and certainly not treated. So uh, I often compare this a little bit. Um, I, I don't know how much you guys know about the history of primary hyperparathyroidism and parathyroid tumors. This is, was a disease that back in the 70s to 80s before we could reliably measure calcium and parathyroid hormone was thought to be exceedingly rare uh, and now uh, is one of the most common uh, endocrinopathies uh, occurring in about 2% of all women over the age of 45. And, and it feels like with primary hyperaldosteronism and subclinical Cushing syndrome, for that matter, we're we're sort of in the 1970s uh, compared to a lot of the other endocrine uh, diseases. And a lot of it has to do with... Um, uh, with a, you know, people are not looking for it. And, and then the biochemical workup is, is a little bit more complex uh, compared to, to, to many other diseases. Uh, next slide, please. So this brings us over to, to Cushing. So we'll talk about uh, cortisol. And uh, I just included this picture because this was hanging outside uh, my office uh, at Yale, this is of Harvey Cushing. And if you ever have an opportunity to go and walk, uh, go and see the Cushing Library at the at the Yale University Medical Library, uh, it's quite quite interesting. So Harvey Cushing was, of course, uh, yes. I have a question about the the collection of his brains. Yes, I certainly have seen the brains. So I, I I can tell a quick story about that. That was actually his. He collected, uh, number one thing that he did was that he made drawings of pretty much all his operations, but then he also collected the brains of his patients. And of course, he's the father of uh, American neurosurgery. And for many years, his collection of brains were lost in, in, a, in, in sort of the, the basement of, of an old medical building at the medical school until a few medical students and uh, Dr. Spencer, who was the professor at neurosurgery at the time, uh, um, champion taking care of this and now created a whole a library with, with a collection of, of the brains from his patients back in the day. Was he at Hopkins first and then Yale or? Yeah, so he, uh, so he, went to Yale undergraduate. So he was actually on the Yale 19, 1888 Yale undergraduate baseball team. Um, and I actually have a photo from that. So he, he was an undergraduate at Yale and then he uh, uh, went to Hopkins, of course, became uh, a chair uh, or was at Hopkins for a long period of time, became, became chair at Peter, what was called Peter Brigham. Now, of course, Brigham and Women's up in, at Harvard. And then he returned to Yale in his uh, um, sort of uh, in his late career. And of course, um, you, I, I don't need to tell this audience about the signs and symptoms of Cushing syndrome. Uh, next slide. I always think this slide is detrimental because like a doctor who doesn't see much Cushing see has this picture imprinted in their brain. It says, 
oh, you don't have that thin, that much thin extremities. You don't have this easy bruising. You don't have all these symptoms. Therefore, you don't look like this lady. Therefore, you don't have it. Yeah, uh, uh, and that's a very true observation. We certainly see, uh, uh, of course, you see a lot of patients with pituitary Cushing's disease, uh, but uh, we certainly see a lot of patients with adrenal subclinical Cushing syndrome uh, that certainly looks nothing like, well, we certainly have patients that do look like this lady, but uh, they come in all sizes and shapes and you, you have uh, plenty of, of uh, slender women uh, without uh, you know, those, those features. But I think the, the point um, I wanted to say is, of course, pituitary hypercortisolism or Cushing's disease when it comes to overt Cushing syndrome is the most common and, and overt adrenal hypercortisolism comprises about 15 to 25%. But this of course does not include patients with subclinical Cushing syndrome, which, which is a disease entity. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, but it's probably of all disease entities that are associated with too much cortisol, the, the most common and even more common than Cushing's disease. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, just to bring you back to the, to the laboratory again. So we uh, performed, similarly as we had done with our lostrum producing tumors, we, we performed a uh, whole exome sequencing, meaning we sequenced entire uh, protein coding region of matched tumor samples of normal and tumor from 25 patients with cortisol producing adrenocortical tumors. Three of them had adrenocortical carcinoma and 22 had a benign adenoma. And then we had an additional cohort of 38 patients. So in total, uh, uh, 36 out of 63 patients had overt ACTH independent Cushing syndrome, meaning adrenal source of their Cushing syndrome. And uh, 27 had subclinical uh, disease. All of them had undergone unilateral adrenalectomy with a mean tumor size of 5.2 centimeters. Next slide, please. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. So when you look at, uh, I'm not going to go into this uh, in too much uh, detail. Yeah, so the way we define uh, subclinical uh, for, for this study, uh, it's almost uh, easier to explain how we defined overt. So the overt uh, Cushing syndrome was defined based on uh, clearly elevated 24-hour urine-free cortisol, suppressed ACTH, failure uh, to suppress on low-dose dexamethasone so suppression test, together with classical signs and symptoms, as you saw uh, from this uh, uh, picture of the lady. Subclinical uh, was defined as those that did not have the overt uh, symptoms, but, but still had biochemical indices consistent with subclinical disease. And uh, without going into this in too much detail, what we did identify in this study that was published in Nature Genetics is that the most common cause of adrenal Cushing's syndrome is a, is a somatic mutation in a gene called PRKACA. Um, next slide, please. This uh, gene, uh, so in a similar as I showed about aldosterone producing tumor, these are uh, the cortisol producing tumors in, in the adrenal gland. And in the normal cell, you have a protein kinase A, which is silent because the catalytic subunit is bound to the regulatory subunit. So you have no cell proliferation and no cortisol production. But in the normal cell, when ACTH binds to its G protein coupled receptor, you have activation of G protein that leads to release of cyclic AMP. That release, the cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. And now when it's free in the cell, it stimulates both cell proliferation as well as phosphorylation of downstream target genes. So when you have these mutations that occurs in these adrenal tumors, uh, the mutation uh, 
interferes with the binding of the catalytic subunit to the regulatory subunit. So you have a constitutively active protein kinase A. So you have this drive consistently for both cell proliferation and cortisol production. Again, these are not inherited mutations. These are sporadic mutations that occur in a single cell and the tumor grows and produces too much cortisol production. Um, but what's interesting clinically is that these mutations only occur in patients with what we define as overt Cushing syndrome. Uh, the genetic mechanisms of subclinical Cushing syndrome are, are, are distinct. So it, it's almost like uh, the, the signs and symptoms uh, certainly overlap and the biochemical indices do, but the molecular pathogenesis is uh, are distinct if you compare overt adrenal Cushing's and subclinical uh, Cushing's. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and next slide. So uh, we published this at the same time. There was actually uh, in the same month, uh, three other groups, one from France and Germany, one from China and one from Japan that showed the exact same thing in, in three. Um, simultaneous mutation. So, so we knew uh, we, we definitely had, had the right gene at this point. Next slide, please. So to, uh, to that comment uh, from one of the audience members, how, how do I define subclinical Cushing syndrome? And uh, relatively recently, we wrote the review about what are the criteria, the biochemical criteria to, do, to call something subclinical adrenal hypercortisolism or subclinical Cushing syndrome. And as you can see from this table, um, there's a, a number of proposed cutoffs as well as tests, biochemical tests to identify patients with uh, Cushing syndrome from uh, low dose dexamethasone suppression alone, or in combination with ACTH, or combination with 24 hour urine free cortisol, or uh, uh, some propose a higher, uh, higher dose of uh, dexamethasone suppression test, and some propose that you need at least two uh, samples of a uh, suppressed ACTH, urine free cortisol, and and uh, low dose dexamethasone suppression test. What, <clears throat> of course, um, this is a classic example of sensitivity and specificity with testing. So number one, what this, that this tells us is there is no single one test that is ideal because if there were, uh, there wouldn't be suggestion of, of testing uh, with, with a lot of different tests. Number two, uh, is the dilemma if you have too loose criteria, uh, the risk is that you're going to identify a lot of false positives, meaning you're going to think that the patient have subclinical Cushing syndrome when they don't. Uh, but if you make the criteria too stringent, you're going to miss a lot of patients, meaning you have um, false negatives, meaning that they truly have Cushing's syndrome, but you're not picking them up. So uh, in, in most patients, so when, fortunately, when they come to us, because endocrinologists tends, tend to love measuring a lot of things and they like to measure a lot of things more than once, uh, it's often not a problem uh, that, they, that they only have, for instance, measured the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. But in, in my mind, the, the best screening test for subclinical Cushing syndrome is a combination of a, a suppressed ACTH with a low dose dexamethasone suppression test with, that fails to suppress to, to 1.8. Um, I'm, I'm certainly very happy if it's been done more than once uh, to guide uh, our discussion with the patient whether surgery is indicated. And uh, the other thing I should say with patients that have 
Uh, there's new, new emerging data that suggests that a low DHEAS uh, is, is helpful as well in identifying these patients. In uh, often get asked about, you know, shouldn't the 24-hour urine free cortisol be elevated as well? I, in my experience, uh, patients almost never have elevated 24-hour urine free cortisol unless they have overt uh, adrenal Cushing syndrome, meaning it's 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 a specific test. Meaning if it's positive, it's quite likely that they truly have Cushing's syndrome. But if it's normal, uh, uh, they, the patient certainly still can have Cushing's. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, so in in this uh, uh, manuscript, we, we wrote that. And, and again, this, this, are patient, this is in the setting where the patient already have an adrenal tumor, uh, an adrenal incidentaloma, but uh, we stated that given the low rates of complications and the possibility to reverse the detrimental effects of elevated cortisol secretion, we recommend minimally invasive adrenalectomy patients with biochemically proven or even only suspected subclinical Cushing syndromes who are appropriate surgical candidates. I think what is, to, what yeah. ACTH level do you like to look at for suppressed? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think like, you know, if it's less than 10, I certainly feel more comfortable about it. Once you get, um, you know, of course, we always what we worry about the most, or what I worry about the most as an adrenal surgeon is that we're going to operate on the adrenal on some a patient that really have pituitary disease, right? Is that, I mean, that's what we worry about the most. So if the ACTH is 30, 40 or above, you know, uh, then then would be the time I, I, I would worry about it. What, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, I, I like to see that suppressed ACTH. Um, and, you know, sometimes it jumps around a little bit. So I think, you know, a few values less than 10 is crucial. I think, um, as you said, distinguishing between pituitary and adrenal Cushing's is, is crucial also. Um, and um, you can have um, some hyperplasia and even some nodules in pituitary Cushing's, adrenal nodule. Right. Yeah. I think I did uh, get another question here. I'm going to. Uh, so uh, the question is, so there are reasons why some patients are overt and have expected test results, high cortisol, low ACTH, no suppression, high 24 hour urine free cortisol, others present as subclinical Maybe high midnight cortisol saliva, high midnight uh, cortisol serum, and so forth. Yeah. So there, there's there certainly are, as as I alluded to, with patients with subclinical disease, it's it's certainly rare that they have you know frankly high 24-hour urine free cortisols. Um, but but as Dr. Friedman said, we definitely do want to see a suppressed ACTH. And, and I, I would say if a patient has a completely perfect response to low dose dexamethasone suppression test, it's probably not subclinical disease, uh, subclinical hypercortisolism. Um, <clears throat> but, but certainly uh, salivary cortisol levels uh, are, are, you know, uh, 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 adjunct test two that we factor in as well, but uh, it, it's definitely both a genetic and and clinical distinct uh, disease between overt Cushing's, adrenal Cushing's, and subclinical. Again, subclinical much much more common, but um, both for overt and subclinical Cushing syndrome in the pre and pero setting uh, it's, it's very similar when it comes to the surgery. The mini back scope erythelectomy uh, is definitely the preferred approach in, in greater than 95% of the cases. We monitor their uh, diabetes. If they have diabetes, hypertension, and potassium very, very carefully. We, we performed a cosentropin, so ACTH stimulation test at 4 a.m. on postoperative day one. 
there's been a, a was a, a nice recent article I shared with Dr. Friedman in, in JCEM, uh, just uh, looking at trying to identify those patients that are adrenally insufficient right after the operation. Obviously, in this scenario, having adrenal insufficiency is a, is a wanted issue, right? Because that truly proves that the tumor was overproducing. But that helps us tailor which patient should be placed on, on corticosteroids uh, as an outpatient. Um, in almost most patients, especially with some clinical disease, no or low levels for a short period of time of, of hydrocortisone uh, uh, works in the majority. If they've had very long standing and very significant overt Cushing syndrome, it certainly can take a long period of time for that contralateral gland to kick in. Um, for patients that have bilateral adrenal Cushing's most common is bilateral um, micronodular hyperplasia or PPNAD, uh, a cortical sparing partial bilateral uh, mini back scope adrenalectomy is often the preferred uh, option. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the uh, exception to that is, is, is what Dr. Friedman alluded to at the very beginning in patients that have failed uh, Cushing's disease, meaning they have failed pituitary surgery, they have failed medical therapy, and uh, the, the best uh, option at this point is, is bilateral total uh, adrenalectomy. In this scenario, of course, you want to <laughs> remove all uh, adrenal tissue and as uh, Dr. Friedman shared uh, his experience uh, in an article about patients that have adrenal rests or remnants. So when you do these operations, it's absolutely critical that you get every single adrenal cell uh, removed. And uh, from experience of training dozens and hundreds of, of doctors, the reason there is adrenal tissue uh, rests in this scenario is that either the surgeon doesn't remove the entire adrenal gland or they spill adrenal cells that subsequently implant uh, into, the, into the adrenal bed. We see this all the time in pheochromosatomas where benign pheochromosatoma cells that are spilled during the operation implant into the retroperineum and the exact same uh, uh, issue happens if you leave, uh, leave a remnant. So uh, for bilateral, uh, so for failed Cushing's disease, certainly you do want to remove uh, uh, both adrenal glands completely. And this is uh, much more favorable to do through the mini-back scope uh, adrenalectomy approach as opposed to the laparoscopic because uh, the visualization, visualization of the adrenal gland is, is much better. Um, I, I think I got a question about uh, adrenal uh, rests. Yeah, so, so the question is, what is your experience with the rate of rest tissue after bilateral adrenalectomy? And is, it's, is the question, is it the surgeon uh, who has left it? So uh, the, the, the experience, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, there hasn't been a huge uh, comprehensive study that have looked at, uh, at what the true prevalence of adrenal rests after bilateral adrenalectomy really are. I think Dr. Friedman's and his study of 11 patients, it's one of the larger ones. So obviously bilateral adrenalectomy for Cushing's disease is not a very frequently used procedure. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that you have a recurrence uh, in the adrenal bed unless you, you follow these patients out for, for several years. So it's a little bit difficult to know exactly what the number is. I think uh, with modern technique, of surgery where you can remove uh, and you have a very high confidence that you remove all adrenal tissue, it should be 
it should be very low. But as I mentioned, the average number of adrenal operations being done by American adrenal surgeons are one per year. And, and certainly uh, we, we, we see uh, incomplete adrenalectomies all the time, meaning the patient has said, been, been told that every single week this comes up where the patient has been told that they had the adrenal gland completely removed and, and I'm looking at the CT scan and it's certainly not removed. Yeah, so that, that brings us to pheochromosatoma. Similarly, uh, more than 95% uh, of, of cases, the mini back scope, adrenalectomy is the preferred approach. Uh, familial disease is quite common, up to 20%. Uh, these patients are blocked before, before surgery. What's key is to have a dedicated anesthesia team because the patient can have some fluctuations uh, in their blood pressure and heart rate. But we have anesthesia team that are used to doing multiple pheochromosatoma operations every single week. So as long as you have a good team, it's actually not that big of a deal. And we don't even block patients unless their catecholamines are five times uh, greater than normal. So if they have a small pheo that's one or two centimeters, I, I don't even block the patients because they do fine anyway. Um, for bilateral disease, a cortex sparing partial uh, adrenalectomy is the preferred approach. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to mention real quick, we also do mini back scope adrenalectomy for adrenal metastasis. This is a patient with lung cancer. Uh, next one. And uh, this is a patient with a colorectal cancer uh, that came uh, from from Southern California for a partial adrenalectomy. As you can see here, he had a single metastasis to his left adrenal that shows up on the PET scan and uh, performing a cortex sparing approach, removing the malignancy, but at the same time preserving enough adrenal tissue. Uh, he was able to uh, uh, go on uh, without hormone, uh, uh, without corticosteroid replacement, because we're able to preserve uh, enough adrenal tissue. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, another interesting case uh, talking about uh, what patients have been told and what the real life uh, is. So this patient had had a previous right nephrectomy and what was told uh, he had a left adrenalectomy for metastatic renal cell cancer. So the arrow now points to a recurrence in his right adrenal gland. So of course this present, uh, a, presents a dilemma because he already had left adrenal gland removed and now he's got a cancer that's invading his right adrenal. Next slide, please. But as you can see, when I'm looking at the CT scan, what does he have on the left side? Well, he has a completely normal left adrenal gland. So even though he was told that he had a previous left adrenalectomy, uh, they certainly didn't do a total adrenalectomy because his left adrenal is, is right there. So of course, in this situation, this was great because we could easily remove his, his right adrenal metastasis, and then we did measure a cosentropin stimulation test, as you can see the numbers here, uh, which showed a beautiful stimulation uh, of his cortisol levels at 30 minutes and at 60 minutes, which proves that he has a completely normal uh, uh, left functioning cortisol response, and thus uh, he did not require any uh, corticosteroid supplementations. Uh, next slide, please. And this, yeah, that just shows the tumor. And this talks about uh, cort cortex sparing adrenalectomy. This is on the right side. And as I alluded to, uh, you can see how the visualization is so much uh, better going through the back as opposed to going through uh, the abdomen. You can directly see the inferior vena cava, cava of the IVC. On the, on the right side with a normal adrenal cortex. 
This is a patient who had MAN2 uh, due to bilateral uh, and had bilateral pheochromosomas, but we're able to preserve about 30% of normal adrenal cortex. Um, so even though she was young and had bilateral five centimeter uh, uh, chromosomas, we were able to preserve sufficient adrenal cortex that uh, she did not need to be on supplementations uh, long term. Uh, she needed it for about six weeks and then she was able to come off uh, hydrocortisone. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, is the hand port needed to go through the back? No, we never, we don't, we don't use the hand port through the back. The hand port is only used for big tumors if, if you go through the front. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just briefly, when is mini back scope and electomy not the preferred uh, approach? Next slide. So, uh, this, uh, so this is an example of the hand port. Uh, so this is a huge uh, 16 centimeter right pheochromosotoma. And obviously in this scenario, you need about a eight, nine centimeter incision anyway, um, just to remove the tumor. So in this particular case, because the tumor was so big and it was pushing on the liver and the kidney and the IVC and the aorta, as you can see here, the best approach was to do this uh, through the abdomen with a hand port assisted uh, laparoscopic approach. Next slide, please. Uh, also uh, for patients that have pheochromocytomatosis, this is an entity uh, uh, and this was a patient who was operated on at the uh, Mayo Clinic and they clearly violated the capsule and uh, tumor pheochromocytoma tumors spilled into the adrenal band and the retroperineum. And of course, this is disseminated disease. So uh, some people might think, well, is this, you know, a malignant pheochromosotoma? So it's not a malignant pheochromosotoma. This is iotrogenic, meaning you have spillage of tumor cells and they implant. Similar, if you were to spill a parathyroid tumor in the neck, the patient develop parathyroidmatosis. The same thing happens with pheochromosotomas, if you spill tumor cells, they're gonna implant and, and grow back. Um, next slide. So uh, this just shows on a CT scan where the tumor tissue is in the adrenal bed. Next slide. And then in the paracolic gutter, you'll have all these little implants of pheochromosotoma tumor cells. Next slide. So this required, of course, an open uh, operation where we removed, uh, and you can see there's literally 30, 40 little uh, tumor implants on the spleen and on the omentum and in the left adrenal bed. And, and this is, of course, something you have to uh, remove through open surgery. Uh, next slide. But uh, I think I convinced you, uh, hope, hope I've convinced you that the Minibac uh, scope electomy is preferred approach in about 96.3% because it's better, it's faster, shorter length of stay, patients have less pain, faster recovery and uh, superior cosmetic uh, results. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just to, to end, uh, a lot of our patients come to us because they have what's called an adrenal incidentaloma. This is a patients that have had a CT scan most commonly for other reasons. And it turns out that adrenal incidentalomas are quite common. And in many cases in the past, these have been ignored. But what we do now, uh, do know nowadays that about 20% turn out to be functional, meaning hormone producing. Next slide. And uh, as an easy rule of thumb, about 5% turn out to be pheos, 5% aldos, 5% adrenal Cushing's, and 5% uh, 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 proved to be metastasis. So the question, if I did this uh, op uh, operations at Yale, yeah, so um, this uh, mini back scope adrenalectomy or the technical name of it is called posterior retroperinoscopic adrenalectomy. Um, 
so the operation was popularized by uh, my good friend uh, in Germany, Martin Waltz, uh, and I spent some time um, back there. So I've done this operation for all the, all more than 10 years. So for the vast majority of, of uh, my time at Yale, I, I, I did this procedure there as well. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we do more of these operations than, than anywhere in the country. I think uh, I got um, yeah. So, so, so with, with that, with that, I stop, and I'll, I'll open up to to questions, and and maybe Dr. Friedman uh, wants to moderate. Yeah. So please ask. Uh, go ahead and ask questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Carl. Your amazing talk, and you do amazing work. You want to answer the, some of the chat questions then? Why is this not taught in university? Why don't other doctors do it this way? So it is actually taught uh, at university and 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 some people do. So when I was at Yale, I was the program director of the endocrine surgery fellowship. So I've, I've trained dozens of endocrine surgeons. Um, still, it this uh, the, this technique is a little bit more technical. So unless you do a lot of these operations, um, you, you're not going to be as as facile. And the way um, it is, that, so even at even at you know the most you know the most well known hospitals university hospitals in the country if they do this procedure they only may do between 10 and 20 of these operations in a year and, and that's due to the fact that adrenal disease compared to other endocrine surgical diseases are are not as common um so it's um so so it's an operation that's done uh most places around the country are still doing the laparoscopic uh, uh, adrenalectomy or do they do the robotic uh, adrenalectomy. And the reason is because uh, a lot of urologists uh, have done prostates and kidney operations and they figure, well, we'll just apply the same technique to the adrenal uh, or general surgeons or uh, general surgeons are not trained to work in the retroperineum. They trained doing gallbladders and, and stomach operations and, and uh, you know, bariatric surgery through the abdomen. So unless you sort of rethink your approach and, and, and you have to also be pretty technically um, facile and being able to, you, you have to be a little slick in the operating room to be able to do it, this operation because the the space that you're working in is is a lot tighter. Oh, so um, so I get it. So the the question is for patients traveling to your center, how long do you usually recommend they stay in Tampa? Okay, that's a great question. So let's say uh, the operation is on a Tuesday. Uh, most people would come in. Uh, Monday afternoon uh, to Tampa, then they every patient sees me uh, in the morning, and I do I do a very specific adrenal protocol CT scan the morning of the operation. I do this for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want to get very detailed information where the tumor is in relationship to all the important vessels. A lot of patients have had previous scans, but they are often of very variable quality, whether they are PET scans or MRIs or CT scans. The other reason I do the scan is uh, it's not uncommon that we do partial adrenalectomies through the mini back scope approach. And I want to I want to see exactly where the remnant normal adrenal cortex is located that I want to preserve and where, where the tumor is. Because the goal is obviously to remove the tumor completely, but then if we can remove the tumor and secondly, also preserve adrenal tissue, 
I certainly <laughs> wouldn't do that. Unless, as we talked about, I operate for failed Cushing's disease. Um, so the patient then would come in uh, Tuesday morning. They would see me both before the uh, CT scan, and then I would come back and talk to them and go through the CT scan uh, again. Then the patient has the operation. They spend one night in the hospital, get discharged from the hospital uh, on Wednesday, and then travel on, on Thursday. So patients would come in latest Monday afternoon and then fly out Thursday. Then uh, the next question is, uh, uh, do you do complete bilateral adrenalectomy often? Yeah, so uh, it's actually something we've been doing uh, more and more. Um, uh, I presume that, that it, it's from the, in the setting of failed Cushing's uh, disease. So patients that have had uh, pituitary surgery uh, that's either failed, as we know, uh, about 30% either have persistent or recurrent disease. Um, even even uh, in, in the best of hands. And of course, since uh, we're, you know, in the same way as finding the best adrenal surgeon is very important, it's obviously important to find the best pituitary surgeon if you have Cushing's uh, disease. This is of course performed by a neurosurgeon. So uh, we, it's not a service that we have at the Carling Adrenal Center or the hospital for endocrine surgery. But uh, we do uh, at least once uh, or twice a month, we do complete bilateral adrenalectomies and, and in all, the cases uh, we've, we've done it um, has been in the setting of failed uh, pituitary Cushing's disease. Um, I think uh, it, uh, it's something that I think more patients are going to opt for. Of course, you're trading one disease for another. Um, so in all these other scenarios, whether you're operating for aldosterone producing tumor or chromosatoma, uh, you're pretty mm -hmm. much curing the patients. Uh, the concept about doing bilateral adrenalectomies in failed Cushing's disease is, of course, different. You're trading one really bad disease, Cushing's disease, for something that can be somewhat monitored adrenal insufficiency uh, with medications. But um, uh, the, the, the concept is, is a little bit different in the sense that um, it, it certainly uh, is something we, I speak to their endocrinologist uh, in more detail. If in a patient has an adrenal Cushing's tumor, it's straightforward to remove the tumor, the patient is cured. Uh, in when we do bilateral adrenalectomies, it's very important that both the patient and their healthcare providers are all on the same page because obviously I can do the operation, but let's say it's Dr. Friedman's patient. He's the one who's going to manage the patient for the next 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, for their adrenal insufficiency. So it's important that, that everybody uh, uh, are on the same page. And uh, when we have the type of relationships that we have with Dr. Friedman, that makes it very easy because he uh, usually makes sure the patient has their, all their patient education done beforehand and have prescriptions for their supplementation after and, and so forth. So it's very, very important in those patients, but it certainly is something that we do more and more. And, and, and that's an that's a international trend. Yeah, um, it's a, a great question. A great answer is, um, you know, it's one of the most difficult decisions we have is whether to do the bilateral adrenalectomy or not. Um, as Dr. Carling says, it's, it's trading a horrible disease Cushing's for a, a bad disease that's quite manageable Addison's, but you know, it is the rest of your life. And if you can get by with something that uh, takes out your pituitary tumor, you're on hydrocortisone six to eight months to not a year, you go on with your life, you know, here, this is the rest of your life. So please, um, we uh, talk to me about it. Long, talk to me long and hard about this decision. Um, you can talk to people in the chats, but I think, at least from Dr. Carlin's viewpoint, the surgery is so much easier than it used to be. So at least it used to be people say, you know, ten percent mortality was adrenal surgery. I that's way too high, and that was the old days when 
they did open surgeries. Um, but I think the, the procedure doing the surgery now is so much better with Dr. Carling's expertise that that might push you a little bit more towards doing the uh, bilateral adrenalectomy, but it's still better to get cured with uh, pituitary surgery. And um, I know we have some of the patients um, on this uh, call that we're, um, we're going through that discussions at now and we're uh, it's still in the process. Yeah, so um, uh, the next question is, is it harder to take out rest tissue? Yeah, so, um, you know, the one of the principles of surgery, it's always easiest and best to uh, do the operation one time the first time, right? So if you have, uh, so the, the technical issue with uh, rest tissue is now you're dealing with scar formation from the previous operation. So from a technical point of view, uh, it's, it's, it's more difficult in the sense that, um, and, and certainly not, you know, it, it's certainly doable, but you don't have the same beautiful planes. You don't have the same anatomy because the uh, adrenal veins have probably been ligated and clipped before. So you don't have the same sort of landmarks that you do when you operate in, in a non touched field in, in, in sort of a virgin environment, but it's certainly, it's certainly doable, but it, you know, if you, if you're going to have uh, an operation taking out uh, adrenal rest tissue, you certainly want to have uh, an adrenal surgeon that, that does this day in and day out, because it's going to be more difficult uh, because of the scar tissue for sure. Uh, then the question is, what can you do to convince endocrinologists that removing both adrenal glands after failed pituitary surgeries is necessary for patients' quality of lives? Many endocrinologists say, I'm not comfortable with you having no adrenal glands, even when the patient has a strong and long history of persistent cortisol. Well, I think we touched on that a little bit and, and Dr. Friedman, you know, gave his, uh, his sort of uh, sense, you know, as, as being the provider for the next 10, 20, 30 years, meaning forever managing this. But I, I think um, as, as more and more patients have bilateral adrenalectomies and they do well, and we will certainly report our findings. I think we can, we can slowly move the needle. I think many endocrinologists uh, are conservative in nature and sometimes for good reasons. Um, so, uh, but there are certainly studies out there showing improved quality of life with bilateral adrenalectomy versus medical treatment alone, for, that's for sure. Yeah. I think we've already moved the needle that BLA has replaced radiation therapy as a second line treatment for pituitary cushions. Um, and then the question is, um, oh, uh, so with the mini back, I think it's going to be the mini back scope and like to me, do you need to move the organs? No. So one of the advantages is that I alluded to is that you get right on top of the, the kidney where the adrenal gland is. So you don't even you, you don't even see the bowel and the colon and, and, and these other structures. So that's the beauty. Whereas if you go through the abdomen, you have to move the bowels, you have to move the colon on the left side, you have to move the pancreatic tail, you have to move this, the spleen and, the, and on the right side, the, the liver. So um, it certainly is a lot uh, more direct approach going through the back. Uh, next question is, how do the outcomes of your uh, operation compare to robotic surgery for remnant uh, rest tissue? Uh, so we haven't done a head-to-head um, -head comparison. I, I, like most other people, have tried out the robot in, in, in the past. The robot doesn't 
add anything. The only thing I said, it adds time and expenses. So the, the robot is great for prostate surgery uh, or anybody uh, that are recommending robotic adrenalectomy for your adrenal operation uh, that suggests that they're just not experienced because it's just a waste of time, to be honest with you. Um, next um, question is, I live in Canada. No doctor does the mini vaccovirolectomy. They will do laparoscopic, uh, uh, do laparoscopic. So my 24-hour urine cortisol is 1447. I assume that's SI units. Yeah, when normally it's 275. It was a tumor. Didn't show up when I had the MRI. I was told I need bilateral. I don't like them. This is a recurrence. So, um, well, I won't comment on, on the, the right. diagnosis, but, but uh, we certainly operate on, on patients from Canada every single week. So people fly down. And now uh, as COVID is winding down and the border is open, uh, we certainly have people coming down from Canada for their adrenal surgery. Right. So I'd recommend Janice to make an appointment to see me. And then, um, you know, I would um, talk to her about benefits and risks of BLA and make sure, um, make sure that's the best option. Yeah. And, and, and this is another good question. How do you ensure all adrenal cells are removed? Do you bag the adrenal before pulling it out? Can you describe how that is helpful versus scraping tissue? Yes. Yeah, so you, you definitely don't want to scrape tissue. So a couple of principles, and, and if you're curious about seeing the actual technique, I have about six to eight um, videos that are more or less detailed on my website where you can actually see the operation in, in great detail. If you're extremely squeamish, you may not want to do that and just watch the, um, uh, there's sort of an animated one that explains the operation, so you could start with that. Um, but yes, um, we do put the adrenal in what's called an endocatch bag. It's a little plastic bag. And the purpose of that bag is that as we extract the, uh, the tumor or the adrenal gland, uh, it's, uh, it stays safely within that bag uh, and, and doesn't rupture. Um, so you definitely don't want to scrape it off. And the <clears throat> even uh, uh, some uh, experienced adrenal surgeons might spill adrenal tissue. And that's one of the principles with adrenal surgeries to never grab and hold on to the adrenal gland. One of the principles are that, so for instance, uh, the adrenal vein is something we can hold on to with a grasper and, and that won't uh, disrupt the tissue. But if you, if you take an instrument and, and sort of try to hold the adrenal, it's so friable, so it's gonna rupture and that's when you have spillage of, of uh, adrenal cells. So, um, so that's, uh, so certainly no, no scraping of the tissues. Um, next question is, do you recommend doing anything if after BLA still producing normal cortisol, but no Cushing's uh, symptoms? I would say no. I mean, I think you really uh, you want to treat the symptoms. Um, I have uh, I have an interesting patient in my series that had both uh, radiation therapy and adrenal bilateral adrenalectomy with remnant tissue, and she's making just the right amount of cortisol. She doesn't need hydrocortisone. She's not over replaced or under replaced. So I think if you're making normal cortisol, you might be okay with uh, out proceeding. Yeah. I'm going to ask the last question. We had some great questions today. This is sort of a theoretical question, but. You know, in um, hyperparathyroidism, we have four parathyroid glands enlarged. At least they used to recommend taking out like a half of one of the four glands and implanting it in like a place like the arm. Do you see anything similar to that with a bilateral adrenalectomy to take out, um, you know, most of the tissue and put some other, to put the tissue either labeled somehow or put it in an accessible place so that they can make just a little bit of cortisol? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and, and there's actually been studies and, and this used to be done, um, but, but it's not really practice any, anymore, but it does actually work. Um, so, so what you can do is uh, if, 
if uh, you know you're you're concerned about the remnant you leave behind that you can either uh, freeze and and cryopreserve adrenal tissue or immediately uh, dispense it and inject it uh, either into the subcutaneous tissue or or into the into the muscle. Um, the a potential problem uh, if the patient has has a recurrence, you know, especially if you've leave, left the remnant in the adrenal gland, and then you have a, a a piece of adrenal tissue either in the in the subq fat, for instance, uh, you know, where 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 is the recurrence coming from? So I think most people um, pre prefer to just leave a, a remnant, for instance, in the setting of you know bilateral pheochromocytomas, for for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So it was a great uh, webinar tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlene. You're doing great work. We're happy to send you, um, probably get increased business. I'm happy to send you some more patients. And uh, we'll be both on my uh, website and goodhormonehealth.com and Dr. Carlene's website, adrenal.com in the next uh, couple of days or so. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Great job. Okay, good night.